Okay, who's got some answers? Some divine wisdom that's been cast upon you this morning. Omnipresent. Pardon me? Omnipresent. Omnipresent. What's that mean? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Scott. The author of everything. Okay. Okay. Never changes. That's going to be important in our lesson this morning. Right. Anything from this side of the room? Okay. Again, going to be important this morning. I'm sorry? Okay. Again, right on, right on cue with the lesson this morning. Unconditional love. Did you did you study much sermon notes or something? Yes, sir. <laughs> I suppose everybody's got a Bible of some type in your possession right now, don't you? Some way, shape, or form. Well, the Bible is full of stories. And whether you, tr- you treat it as one big story from beginning to end, or you divide it in two and, have, and treat the Old Testament as one story, the New Testament as another, or you can count each book as a separate story, or you can treat each individual story separately as it appears, it doesn't matter how you break it down. Each story from Genesis 1 through Revelation 22 answers in one way or another a singular question. What is God's nature? And that's what we're going to be looking at. Over the course of the next two weeks, we're going to look at a story out of the book of Joshua that if you, if you just read over it, it just sounds like another history lesson. But when you look at it through the lens of what is God's nature in this story? What is he doing? How is he doing it? What, he, what, is he, what is he trying to teach me through this story? Uh, it, it really works to reveal his nature. Now the story that we're going to look at this morning has a little bit of a prologue. Or a, and I apologize for my voice. I'm not sure what's going on, but it's, uh, it's, it's fading. It's a little bit of a background or a prologue that we need to, uh, to understand a little bit of, of why, why what we're reading is important. And that starts in uh, Joshua 6, verses 18 and 19, which, which were part of the lesson last week. And Joshua writes, But you, speaking to the, the Israelites who were going into to Jericho, keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, Lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted and any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So this this is this happens on the seventh day of the siege of, of Jericho. They have spent the first six days marching around the, the city one time, and uh, that was the seventh day when, when things were really going to get serious. And Joshua is giving the final instructions to, to the warriors who are going in. And he makes a point to tell them not to take any of the devoted things for themselves. And these dev- when... When God sent the people across the Jordan River into the land of Canaan, it was for a single purpose. It was to to capture that that land that had been promised to them. 
And this was a vile, a vile civilization that thrived on sexual immorality and child sacrifice. So God's plan was to destroy everything. Every living thing, every structure, every weapon, whatever. Everything associated with that, with that civilization was to be destroyed. Except for the things that he was going to put in his own treasury. They were to be captured and, and used for that purpose. And the warning was, doing otherwise would make Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble on it. What he's saying here is, if you, if you take the things that I've designated for destruction and bring it amongst yourselves, you have brought that into your world now, into your heart, into your, into your society, and then you become my enemy as well. So I ask myself, okay, if, if God wanted Jericho destroyed... Why didn't he just destroy it himself? Early on, when he became disgruntled with civilization, he brought a flood, destroyed the whole thing, except for the eight people on the boat. In dealing with Sodom and Gomorrah, he brought fire from the heavens to destroy it. So what's different with Jericho. What has happened since those other things? Now he has a people. He has the people of God who will do, do this sort of work on his behalf. He doesn't have to do it the way he did before. And going ahead to uh, the first verse in chapter 7. And I looked at one of my old Bibles as I was studying for this, and I got the first word of verse 1. I got a big red square around it. It says, But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Just a little bit of a spoiler alert. We talk a lot about names in the Old Testament, how important they are. Aiton, Aiton, that's my grandson. He's, he's trouble also, but Achan means trouble or disaster. He took some of the devoted things. And he fulfilled what uh, Joshua's promise was would happen if he did that. He set the whole civilization, the whole people of Israel up for destruction by doing that. And you look at the last uh, sentence in, in, uh, in verse 1. It says, And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel because it's one man's sin. And we talk about how, excuse me, how powerful God is. And oftentimes we think of it in a good sense. How he has so much power to, to cover our sins and to see us through tragedy and so forth. But this is the flip side of that power. This is ultimate anger that had been brought upon the people of Israel because of this one man's sin. And I, I got the picture of something out of a Ghostbusters movie or an old Scooby-Doo cartoon or something where the city of Jericho had this like fog or mist or cloud of sin hanging over it. And when Achan took those things and put them under his vest or whatever and took them, a little bit of that just went with him. He, and then he planted it amongst the, amongst the Israelites and it just 
spread and covered the, the, whole, the whole population. So that's, that's the backdrop for the story that we're going to be looking at now. Uh, basically, the, the fact that God's anger is burning against his, his own people now. And we're going to see the, uh, the effects of it. So going on, on to uh, verses 2 through 5. So Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth, Beth Avon, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. And the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not have all the people go up, but let about two or 3,000 men go up and attack Ai. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. So about 3,000 men went up from the people, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shabarim and struck them down at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. First off, we're going to look at a little comparison between Jericho and Ai. In the accounts in the, in that Joshua made here, there's the bulk of two chapters is devoted to the planning of the, of the uh, siege on Jericho and, and the carrying it out and the whole process. This attack on Ai gets four verses. And physically, uh, Jericho was this huge fortress, most powerful fortress in the area. And they went in and toppled it with no bloodshed, toppled it completely, uh, all done through God's work and God's will. All they had to do was show up and obey. Ai was this small little community, uh, not too far away. But attacking Jericho and bringing it down would be like attacking the Pentagon. Whereas attacking Ai would be like would be like uh, trying to take over the VFW on a Friday night. You know, it's not quite the same. But we see in the, in the scripture that the, the, men, the men of uh, Israel, all we hear about them is they were fleeing. We, we get no, no indication of what the battle took place or anything. All we know is that they fled. <clears throat> and the verb that they used for the way they fled was not like they were running away fighting all the way. They were running away with their heads down and their necks exposed in utter shame. And then the effect that it had on the people, the people of Israel. Once this happened, it says that uh, the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Just hopelessness. And if you remember back to when the spies uh, went into Jericho and had their encounter with Rahab, that's the same condition that she said that the people of Jericho were in because of the power that the Israelites uh, represented. So now that God's people, the people who were supposed to go in and conquer this area in more ways than one, are just like the people who were there. They've taken on the sin of that area, that culture, and now they are, they're hopeless. So now we're going to look at a couple of the reactions. Verses 6 through 9. 
And Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening, he and the elders of Israel. And they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would that we had been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. O oh Lord, what can I say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? Well, first off, this... Uh, reaction that Joshua had was one of mourning. He fell on his face, they put dust on their heads, that's all a, a symbol of mourning. But it wasn't like the complaining that the Israelites did when they were out in the wilderness. He was concerned about the name of God and God's people because of what had just happened. And the important thing was, he asked God, how are you going to fix this? So in verses 10 through 15, we're going to see God's reaction. The Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Get up, consecrate the people, and say, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus says the Lord, God of Israel, There are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. And you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought near by your tribes, and the tribe that the Lord takes by lot shall come near by clans, and the clan that the Lord takes shall come near by households. And the household the Lord takes shall come near man by man. And he who is taken with the devoted things shall be burned with fire. He and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he has done an outrageous thing in Israel. So, if we read this, how, how, do, we, how do we characterize God's reaction to Joshua falling on his face and entering this state of mourning. He says, get up. You got, you got bigger problems than losing a battle. And it's, it's time to get to work. It's also interesting to note the first sentence in verse 10. The Lord said to Joshua, to this point in the book, every victory, every high point we see from the time he put Joshua in command, when they crossed the Jordan, when they renewed the covenant, and when they took Jericho, all started with that same sentence. The Lord said to Joshua, we haven't seen that in this chapter so far. It, 
it's kind of a kind of a circular thing, but the Lord has has turned his back on his people because they have they have sinned. They brought this sin into into his people. So he's he stayed quiet. He didn't he did not instruct them to go take AI or any such thing. Is there anybody here who doesn't like potatoes? You don't like potatoes. Well, you're excused from this exercise then. What, what's, what's your favorite way to fix potatoes, anybody? Baked, mashed, french fried, au gratin. Sounds pretty fancy for Bear Lake. <laughs> Personally, I like them. I like them cut up and fried in bacon grease with onions. Anyhow, I think we all, except Deb, agree that potatoes are a good thing, right? Now, has this ever happened to you? You bring home a bag of potatoes, you put them underneath, underneath the cabinet in the cupboard, and you get through most of them, and you see you're needing more potatoes, so you go buy another bag, and you put them in front of the old bag. And one day you come home. What's that smell? You look at the dog. Is that you? What is that? And eventually you go through this process. First you have to identify what the smell is, right? You know, is it a dirty diaper? Is it a can of tuna? Is it a potato? What is it? And once you determine what it is, you have to find where it is. And if it's a potato, you got to go through and you got and you grab that one. Oh man! Oh, so you get that out of there. Sorry, Scott. <laughs> you get that potato out, and there's seven or eight more in there that. They didn't look quite so healthy either. So you get, the, get them out, you get the bag out, you get the bleach or whatever, and you get in that cupboard and you scrub that stuff out. That's the same process that God is putting the Israelites to work at now to get rid of this sin. And that's what happens here in verses... Uh, Yeah, in the, last, in the last half of that passage we just read. First off, we're going to find, we, at, and at this point, at this point, God and Achan are the only ones that know what's happened. It hasn't been revealed to Joshua yet or anybody else. It's just God and Achan. So he's going to put them to the, through the process of sorting through the whole tribe and finding the, the perpetrator. So they bring, they separate them up into the 12 tribes, and then they ca and somebody casts lots, they choose the tribe of Judah, and then they bring th forth, all, forth all the, uh, the clans of Judah, they cast lots again, they bring forth the households of that clan. Finally, all the men of that clan. And the lots fall on Achan. That's what, that's what happened in, in, in searching out and finding uh, who, had, who had done this. Now again, ask a question. Why didn't Spoiler alert, in the end of this, Achan gets killed. Okay? He gets stoned. Why, why did God not just take care of that himself? We've seen him do that before as well. Uh, when Lot's wife turned and looked back, he turned her to a pillar of salt. 
when Elijah's sons, his wicked sons, were revealed, he took care of them himself. We see it a lot. Again, why did he just not, if the whole goal of this was to kill Achan, why didn't he just do it? Yeah, Deb. Right. And also that's a proof that as a church that we should all know the rules and follow them because as a church we can lose our Holy Spirit because of one person or one group mm -hmm. doing something outside the church that looks bad for us and it can ruin the whole for us. Yeah. He had he had to, just like Deb pointed out, he had to let them really know how much he hated sin. And by putting them through this process of making them sort out the character. And the story ends in verses 16 through 26. And it, go, it goes through this same process that, that the Lord had laid out. Joshua rose early in the morning Again, that's a repeat of what he had done in all the previous victories. He rose early in the morning and brought Israel near, tribe by tribe. And the tribe of Judah was taken, and he brought the clans of Judah, and the clan of the Zerahites was taken. And he brought them all forward just the way that, that uh, God had prescribed and Achan was taken. In verse 19, Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord of Israel and give praise to him and tell me now what you've done. Do not hide it from me. Have any of you ever been in a situation maybe with your parent or maybe as a parent or a boss, or a leader, or a coach, or whatever. When you know you've done something wrong, and they know you've done something wrong, and they know you know that you've done something wrong, and all you got to do is tell the truth at that point. But it's so easy. Even, even at that point in the process, you still you want to lie. You want to say, no, I didn't do that. Even though... You know they did it. If you're a parent with a child in that situation, how does it bring honor to you when they fess up and say, yeah, Dad, I'm sorry. That's what I did. That says a lot about you as a parent when they are able to trust you to do what's right and tell you the truth instead of carrying on the lie. And Achan answered Joshua, Truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak of Shinar and 200 shekels of silver <clears throat> and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them and see, they're hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and behold, it was hidden in his tent with, with the silver underneath. And they took them out of the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the people of Israel. And they laid them down before the Lord, and Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah, and the silver and the cloak and the bar of gold, 
and his sons and daughters and his oxen and donkeys and sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them up to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor. So this, this is what it took for that anger that was burning inside God's heart, for that to disappear, was to have that sin that Achan had brought into the people of Israel utterly and completely wiped out. Up to that point, there was no victory possible for the Israelites because they had turned away from God. But going through this, wiping that sin completely out, then they were able to commune again, have fellowship again with God. And next week we will see how that transpires. So like I said, if you just, if you read over this, it, it reads like a history lesson. There's not much dialogue in it, just a lot of uh, action and names and uh, places. But what we have to ask ourselves is, <clears throat> where do I fit in the story? Am I God? Well, no, we go through that every week, right? There's two kinds of people, Jesus and everybody else. There's only one. I can't be him. Can we be Joshua? Can we be... Have we been called to lead the entirety of God's people? No, not really. Are we the people of God? As believers, yeah, we absolutely are. We are, we are the chosen people of God. And just like the Israelites in this story, we have a mission. When, the, when Peter was writing his first letters, he addressed it to elect exiles in a foreign land. And that's the way we have to look at ourselves. We are elect, given that we're chosen by God to be his people. But this is not our home. We'll see our home one day, but this is not it. We're in, a, we're in a strange world. A world that doesn't know us, doesn't accept us. But yet, we have a mission. Every one of us. And as a group, we have a mission. To go into that world the same way the Israelites did when they crossed, <clears throat> when they crossed the Jordan to make this place our own to go in and conquer the things of this world, to fight, to fight the battle. Okay, are we aching? Are we sinners? Yeah. What's the difference between us and Achan? Essentially nothing, right? We all see things in this world that look appealing to us. And we may go get it, may put it in our heart, in our head, on our phone. We think it's buried. 
just like Achan had his treasure buried. But who knew about it besides Achan as soon as it happened? God did, right? Same with us. The difference is our, our debt for that sin has already been paid so that we can continue to have that fellowship of God, fellowship with God that he has to offer. So as we close things out today, uh, you know, the, the challenge with anything like this is how do I apply it to myself? Well, first off, some of the songs these people sang first thing this morning, the themes of them. God so loved the world. That world includes me, right? I see the evidence of his, of his beauty all over my life, right? We ask him to stir a passion in our heart because we can't do this on our own. And we offer gratitude for the things he's done in the past. And this last song we're going to close with this morning just finishes that message off. It's asking God to build my life on what he has done.